you have your Bibles, turn with me to Judges chapter 4 and 5. Uh, most of you have probably heard of Joan of Arc. She was born in the year 1412 during the 100 years war between Great Britain and France. She was the daughter of poor tenant farmers. Her mother was a devout Christian who taught her daughter to live a godly life. Joan never ventured far from home. She was an accomplished seam seamstress, but at the age of 13, she began to see visions, hear voices that she felt were coming from God. She felt that God was calling her to free France from England and return Charles to his French throne. And somehow this, this teenage girl was able to miraculously get a, a meet the French leader when she was only 16 years of age. When she described to Charles specific aspects of a dream he had, it led him to believe that she could indeed do what she said she, she was able to do. So without any previous military experience or training, Joan was given control of the entire French army. Her first acts as the head of the French army were, were to command all of the soldiers to repent of their sins to seek a personal relationship with the Lord and to attend worship services. Following her first major military victory, her reputation spread rapidly. She began to experience other military victories before being captured in the spring of 1430 and held in prison for a year. She would eventually be charged with witchcraft, treason, heresy, and get this, dressing like a man. Joan of Arc was burned while tied to a wooden stake on May 30th of 1431 at the age of 19. Her death sent shockwaves throughout France. It was said her executioner repented before God for carrying out his duties. And the bishop in charge of her trial was pierced to the heart with grief and fear. Mark Twain studied about the life of Joan of Arc for 12 years, and he concluded after that 12 years of study, and I quote, hers was the most noble life ever born into this world, save one, that being Jesus Christ. Now, who would ever think that God would call a young, uh, obscure peasant girl with no military experience to lead a military uh, of men? But God had already done something similar to that 25 centuries earlier. Like Joan of Arc, Deborah was an obscure individual called by God for a very significant purpose. Her story takes place between the years of 1209 and 1169 B.C. It was a period of time we read in our Bibles called the Judges. During this period... It, it, the, the Israelite people would fall away from God, they'd turn from God, and then they would be oppressed by their enemies around them, their neighbors around them, and then after they would repent, God would raise up a leader called a judge who would deliver them from their enemies. Deborah was Israel's only female judge. Her life, her example, is proof that God often uses people who are overlooked by society um, to accomplish great things for him. So uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to read, begin reading from Judges chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. After Ehud's death, Ehud being the judge just before, uh, Israelites were on a cycle of doing this seven times, I believe I counted. And, and so it says, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagoyim. Now Sisera had 900 iron chariots, and he ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at that time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. One day she sent for Barak, a son, son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. She said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. 
you are to call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor. I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. Let's skip on down to verse 12. When Sisera was told that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, he called for all 900 of his iron chariots and all of his warriors, and they marched from Harosheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, get ready. This is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. So Barak led his 10,000 warriors down the slopes of Mount Tabor into battle. When Barak attacked, the, the uh, Lord threw Sisera and all his chariots and warriors into a panic, and Sisera leaped down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Then Barak chased the chariots and the enemy army all the way to Harasheth Hagoyim, killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one was left alive. So if you take out the outline there from inside of your bulletin, the question we need to ask ourselves is what? What qualified Deborah to, to accomplish these things? Well, what qualified her to be chosen by God to militarily, politically, civically lead Israel? Well, as we read through this story, um, I think the first qualification she had is this. She had a willing spirit. Deborah is called a prophet in chapter 4 and verse 4. We're not told how long she had been a prophet. We're not told how God called her to that capacity. But people recognize Deborah's connection with God. They recognize her authority to settle their disputes, much like the people of Israel had many centuries earlier with Moses. After 20 years of oppression at the hands of King Jabin, the people of Israel, once again, as was their history at this time, cried out for freedom to the Lord. God calls on Deborah to lead Israel. Women were not generally the leaders of the military, but Deborah was not only a, an exceptional woman, she was the right person. She was the most qualified person for this assignment. And one thing we learn from history is that God always chooses the right person for specific tasks, regardless of what the culture thinks of that individual at the time, regardless of that person's gender or age or any other worldly qualifications. For instance, God called an unknown farmer named Gideon to lead a small army of 300 Israelites, and with that small army of 300 Israelites, defeated their enemies, numbering 135,000. God called a shepherd boy named David, who had no armor, but just a sling and a few stones to kill a, a nine-foot seasoned warrior named Goliath. God called an obscure, poor Midwesterner named Abraham Lincoln to save our nation during a terribly bitter civil war. And as we learned earlier, I believe God called a teenage girl with no military experience named Joan of Arc to lead an army of French men. I, I say all of that because I'm just thinking to myself as I, as I look out here, is it possible that God could use you and me as insignificant or overlooked we may be by the world around us or how we may feel. Is it possible that God could use you and I to do some amazing, significant things for him today as well? Deborah has received instructions from God to call a skilled military leader named Barak with the command to lead an army of 10,000 Israelites against Sisera's army, and Sisera's army included 900 chariots. Now, folks, chariots in those days were the equivalent of tanks in World War II. The chariots were made of iron or wood. They were pulled by one or two horses. They were the most feared and powerful weapons of that day. Some chariots even had razor-sharp knives extending from the wheels designed to mutilate 
foot soldiers who got anywhere near the chariots. And so, humanly speaking, the odds here were not very good for Israel. Nevertheless, God spoke through Deborah to assure Barak that God would give Israel victory over Sisera's invincible army. Barak conditions his obedience to God, leading the people of Israel upon Deborah going with him. I'm not told exactly why. Uh, Barak might have been a little dubious of Israel's chances, but he saw Deborah's total faith and dependence upon God and maybe drew hope from that as well. I don't know. But Deborah's life, her example, should challenge all of us. You see, her faith was not in herself, but in God. Deborah had a willing spirit because she knew God. She didn't worry about what she could do or what she could not do because she relied instead upon what God could do. How many times in our lives have we been asked to do something? We've been asked to step to the plate or, and, and take on this role, and, and we said no because we weren't comfortable, we didn't think we were qualified for whatever reason, before we even prayed about it, before we even asked God to see what God wanted us to do. Jesus, knowing full well the pain and the brutality of that time leading up to his crucifixion, as well as the crucifixion itself, Jesus prayed, if there's any other way to accomplish this task, Without this suffering, take it from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He knew what he had coming. But for my sake and your sake, he had a willing spirit and did it. Rich Stearns is the United States president of World Vision. He writes, and I'm quoting here, on one of my earliest mission trips, I met Virginia in the mountains of Peru. As a nurse, she chose to give up the well-paid positions in the city to live a Spartan existence high in the mountains. She hiked from village to village, providing medical care to children and families in poverty. Virginia said, and I quote, this is my service. This is not a job. It is my sacrifice. It is my life that I give to Christ. Virginia found tremendous satisfaction in doing what many of us would never even think about doing. But she did because she had a willing spirit and she wanted to do what God wanted her to do. The novelist George Eliot once said, and I quote, it's never too late to be what you might have been. All too often we look at our lives and we go, oh man, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have been that, etc., etc." And George Eliot says, listen, it's never too late to be what you might have been. Here is the reality that Satan does not want you and I to believe. God has given every one of us, I am saying every person here this morning, talents and abilities, experiences and relationships, along with a passion to do something significant for him. Every one of us. Paul says it like this, we are God's handiwork. You and I are God's masterpiece, recreated and empowered by Jesus Christ to do amazing, significant things which God has prepared a long time ago for us to do. Whether we do amazing things for the Lord or not depends on whether we have an attitude like that of of Barak. Well, hey, listen, if you'll go with me, then I'll think about doing it. Or whether we have the attitude of a Deborah, here am I, Lord, use me. It's all about a willing spirit. I'm just here to tell you this morning, nobody is a nobody in Christ's body. Every one of us has significance in Christ's body. Every one of us has been given talents and abilities and experience. No one is useless. No one here is not good enough to do something amazing for the Lord. So whatever our excuses might be or have been, well, I'm not qualified, I don't know enough of the Bible, et cetera, et cetera, I don't speak well, whatever they might be, throw them in the garbage can because that's where they belong. 
The scripture says the eyes of the Lord scan the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Nehemiah said the joy of the Lord is my strength. And Paul said I can do all things not through my strength, not because of my intelligence. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We need to quit listening to what Satan tells us we can't do and start tuning in to what God empowers us to do. So Deborah had that willing spirit, and as a result, God used her in a mighty way. He will do the same with us. But we also see from this story that Deborah also had a secure ego. You see, after Barak requests that Deborah go with him into battle, they march to the battlefield, and Deborah says to him in chapter 4 and verse 14, get ready. This is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. At a time when so many people display their insecurity by constantly drawing attention to themselves, look at what I did. Wow, was that a good play, et cetera, et cetera. It's refreshing to see the attitude of De Deborah. Since Barak wouldn't do battle without her, she very well could have said, hey, this is the day the Lord will give me victory over Sisera. Or she could have even said, this is the day the Lord will give us victory over Sisera. She says to Barak, this is the day the Lord will give you victory. Deborah found her security in being a servant of the Lord. She didn't need the praise of people because she was seeking the higher praise of God. Jesus reminds us, whoever exalts themselves, whoever draws attention to themselves, whoever feels the need to constantly take credit for everything will someday be humbled. That's what Jesus said. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. And when we do the things, the task, the job that we've been hired or assigned to do, we shouldn't exalt ourselves. Jesus encourages us, listen, we are servants who have done only what we were supposed to do. Now listen, I'm a guy, okay? So when I do the dishes, you know, I kind of like an attaboy, you know what I mean, guys? Huh? But the reality is Jesus says, listen, we should tell people we're servants just doing what we're supposed to do. It's a stark contrast between Deborah's security that she found by knowing the Lord and Barak's insecurity because of his inability to fully trust the Lord. Big difference. Trust the Lord, not trust the Lord. Secure in who I am, insecure. Deborah trusted in the Lord. Barak trusted in Deborah. This victory, huge as it may be, was not going to be as a result of any human strategy or any human fighting skill. The enemy would have to cross the plain through which the Kishon River flowed. Now, Barak would come down from Mount Tabor, and these chariots would cross the plain. Now, Kishon, the Kishon River is not a river. It's a stream, except when, in the spring, when the rains come down and it floods over, and, and, and the, the word literally means torrent bed, and it, it, you know, it gets all muddy around, and, and those who are farmers know how difficult it is to take heavy machinery into a field when it's really muddy. And so the same is true of heavy chariots. And so they come across the plain, and they come into this mud because the Kishon River has overflowed, and, and their chariots get stuck in the mud, and they're useless, and and, and the Israelites had this resounding victory. In fact, chapter 5 of verse 21 tells us in Deborah's song, the river Kishon swept them away. God gave them a resounding military victory that on paper looked like it was hopeless. President Ronald Reagan put it very simply like this. There is no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. And as a Christian, we shouldn't care who gets the credit because we ultimately know who gets the credit for doing any good, and that is the Lord. 
So many of today's problems, I think, are directly attributed to low self-esteem. Because the way we see ourselves impacts our core beliefs and the way we act. And if we don't have the proper self-esteem, which I believe our identity comes from the Lord, then we're going to mess up. Margaret Thatcher was the former prime minister of Great Britain. It was said she was visiting a retirement community, a nursing home, one day, shaking hands with the residents. And, and uh, when it seemed that there was one resident who wasn't particularly impressed with Thatcher because she didn't really recognize who she was, the prime minister asked her, do you know who I am? And the lady said, no, but I'm sure if you ask the nurse, she usually knows who everybody is around here. <laughs> Has anybody not seen the Shawshank Redemption, the movie? You haven't? Where have you been? I mean, it's on a hundred times every day, you guys. I'd love to get a, a, a penny for every time it's on television. It's crazy. Red, played by Morgan Freeman, has spent the bulk of his life wasting away in a prison because of some stupid, reckless act of violence when he was a teenager. And after 40 years of incarceration, Red is finally released to enjoy the freedom that he's longed for. However, he can't free himself from a habit he picked up in prison where he, ha he constantly had to ask for permission just to use the men's room. This new life scares him, man. He's, been, he's grown accustomed to the structure of life behind bars. Prison had become safe for Red. Someone else did the thinking for him in prison, and now on the outside he faces the daunting, terrifying task of thinking for himself, making his own decisions. In fact, he's trying to think of some ways that he can break his parole so that he can go back into the comfort and the security of his prison cell. And he sums up his dilemma in one line. He said, it is a terrible thing to live in fear. I think most of us could agree with that. It is a terrible thing to live in fear. Well, understand this right now. If anyone is in Christ, the Bible says he or she is a new creation. The Bible says you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. The Bible says you are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. Before I formed you in, my mo in your mother's womb, I already knew you, God says. I had already set you apart for a purpose. David said, I praise you, O God, because I am wonderfully made, and your works are beyond description. Paul wrote, when we live, we live for the Lord. When we die, we die in the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we live and die for the Lord. And because all of that is true, life doesn't revolve around me, and life doesn't revolve around you either. My passion, my identity, my wisdom, my strength, my energy, it comes from the Lord. So what do I have to boast about anything? What credit can I take for anything good that I might do or you might do in this life? We can't. It all belongs to him. And I will only be secure in who I am as an individual. I will only understand my identity when I realize who I am in Jesus Christ. And not until then. Because in Christ, I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I no longer have to lift up myself. I no longer have to draw attention to myself because the glory belongs to him and only to him. Deborah knew that because she exalted God in her life. God has been using her example for centuries now. God has lifted her up as a challenge to the rest of us. So Deborah had a willing spirit. Deborah had a secure ego because she knew her identity come, came from the Lord. And thirdly, Deborah had a grateful mindset. The fifth chapter of Judges is a masterpiece of Hebrew poetry. It, it's a song composed by Deborah and Barak that gives thanks to God and recognizes God as the one who, who gave them victory in their, uh, over their oppressors. And that theme, giving thanks to God, 
It goes all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament alike. When Hannah received a son from the Lord she had prayed for, Hannah wrote, My heart rejoices in the Lord. There is no one holy like the Lord. David shouted out to the source of his numerous victories over Israel's enemies when he wrote, I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise. He has saved me from my enemies. Paul wrote in the New Testament, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Sing and make music to the Lord in your heart, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, over and over again. Fred Rivera believes that gratitude is a character muscle, and like a physical muscle that needs to be constantly exercised, he says, uh, gratitude needs to constantly be exercised. And, and I quote here, he says, gratitude is something I strive for every day. Now, Rivera was an infantryman in the Vietnam War, and as a result, he's been, he's been struggling with chronic pain ever since then, as well as pain from a physical severe illness he has now. So every Thursday, Fred Rivera participates in a 12-step group called the Gratitude Group. And in the gratitude group, people get in a circle. Hi, my name is Carrie. And here's what I'm grateful for this week. You see, grateful people don't have time to be grumpy people. The story appeared in a, in a newspaper many years ago about a police auction of about 100 bicycles, unclaimed bikes in the District of Columbia, desperately wanting a bike. This 11-year-old boy had saved up his money. And with every bike, he bid $1. But every bike sold for more than $1. And the auctioneer noticed the boy was especially interested in, in the, the racer kind of bikes, the racer type bikes. And when the last one was coming up for auction, uh, the bidding got to $8, already beyond the $1 this boy had. And the auctioneer said, sold to that boy for $9. At which point, he pulled $8 from his own pocket and asked the boy for his dollar. The boy pulled the pennies and the nickels and the dimes out of his pocket, gave it to the auctioneer. With a smile on his face, took the bite, didn't get very far before he stopped. Ran back to the auctioneer and cried as he threw his arms around the guy's neck. When you and I stop to think about what we have been blessed with, we ought to be crying to God in gratitude. I know there are some, probably all of us, who have at one time or another felt overlooked, slighted. Maybe you've continually been overlooked for a job promotion, your age, your your gender, whatever. Maybe, maybe you've been overlooked on your team. And others, you weren't as good as some of the others. Your, your parents weren't the coaches. Maybe, maybe some of you have felt slighted at school because you're not part of the in-group. I mean, we all go through those times where we just feel like we're insignificant and obscure to other people, but I want you to know this, regardless of our age, our gender, our race, our income, our past, our present, our reputation, and so on, God can and God will do amazing things through those of us who the world may view as insignificant. People like Deborah and Joan of Arc and more, when we have a willing spirit when we understand our identity comes from Jesus Christ and when we have a grateful heart,